All right, I think we're live now. Hello, everyone. I hope you've had a great Ramadan and I hope that you enjoyed your Eid. Welcome back to AUI Alumni Tech Talk series of webinars. Thank you all for joining us today. We're really happy to have you today. Um, for those of you who still don't know a lot about our concept, let me just introduce it again real quick. So AUI Alumni Tech Talks are a series of webinars um, presented or organized by the School of Science and Engineering at Al Hawan University in collaboration with IEEE Women in Engineering and Arab Women in Computing. So the main goal behind um, these talks is basically to create kind of a bridge between you, the audience, and AUI alumni who are doing brilliant careers in IT and engineering. So we've had some really amazing talks previously. I really advise you to go and check those on the official channel of, of uh, on YouTube. And um, these webinars are actually happening and taking place because we have an amazing organizing committee. So big, big thanks to um, Rita Lalawi, Tissam Latashi, and Huda Shakiri. Thank you so much, ladies, for the efforts and for the time you're investing in these webinars. And a much bigger thanks to our speaker for today, Tilil Al Mujahid. Thank you so much for being with us today. We're really happy to have you. So, Quick introduction, so Tilila majored in computer science at Al Khawain University, she's an alumna, and she graduated in 2009. Um, she is currently a data and AI lead at Microsoft, and she's specifically working on democratizing and expanding the use of AI and advanced analytics in the Middle East and Africa. Um, she also holds a master in bioinformatics and she's really passionate about genomics. So she's the perfect person to deliver this, this talk here. Um, she's also a Fulbright Scholar, class 2012, uh, which, is, which is awesome. So uh, Tilila will talk to you today about analyzing your genome in from let's say from an AI and a cloud perspective. Thank you very much, Shalila, for being with us today. We really appreciate your presence and really appreciate um yeah you being with us today and the floor with is yours. Okay. Hey, well um thank you Safa and um hi everyone. Um thanks for the intro. <laughs> And I'm very happy to be here, honestly. Um, it's like uh, coming full circle. I've, I graduated a while ago and I'm very happy to be able to share with you uh, a topic that I'm very, very passionate about. I hope that we have some students with us and some grad students and hopefully this is gonna um, maybe inspire you to pursue this field. There's a lot to do in it. It's very burgeoning. So um, let's, uh, let, let's get right to it. Um, and I'll, I'll start a little bit with the agenda about what we're going to talk about today. And I hopefully you'll find it as exciting as I find it exciting. So because it's a genome talk, the first thing we're going to do is like a genome 101, a little biology refresher to all of you. And then we're going to talk about how do we extract it, how do we sequence it, and then how do we do some analysis on it. Since this is a tech talk, so expect a lot of computer science, some algorithms, cloud, some ML as well. So that's where you'll get to see how this gets to you be used. And then uh, since it's the topic of the day, COVID, so how genomics uh, is being used in the case of COVID and how it helped us um, to, um, to understand it. So I'll go right to it. I know we have a Q&A towards the end. I'll be monitoring the chats and the comments as well, uh, but I'll try to keep uh, the questions towards the end as well. So let's dive right in. And this is going to be your uh, biology uh, refresher, I would say, for those of you who took a biology class or who kind of forgot about it. Uh, this is uh, the foundation. So I would summarize it that our body, um, all of us here in this call, we have about trillions and trillions of cells. Each one of them is made of a nucleus. And each, in each one of them, we have some chromosomes made of DNA. So just as a refresher, we all have 23 chromosomes and X and Y for the sex chromosomes. And every once in a while, you might have some plus or minuses on this one, but these are quite rare cases. So that's pretty much our map. If I were to take every single chromosome and unfold what's in it, you'll find um, that we have what we call amino acids. So they have fancy names, adenine that clings to thymine, guanine that clings to cytosine, right? So this, uh, this is what, what is made of. If I were to take all your DNA and put it in uh, and unfold it all and like kind of print it for you and give you a book, it would be, uh, it would look like this. ATCGs, ATCGs, that's what we would have. 
And we have 3 billion of those amino acids in each one of our cells. So if you're wondering what 3 billion is, if you're like me, you're a fan of Game of Thrones, if you take the whole five books, Songs of Ice and Fire, and you read it 429 times, that's how much time and how much content it is to put all your DNA in one book. So that, that's quite a lot. And it's also fascinating when we think that all of that in its, is in every single cell that we have. Now, all our cells have the same copy of the, our DNA. How come each one becomes a hair or a nail or a liver cell or a synapse? Well, I'm going to bring back an old friend of some of you called the central dogma of biology. And what this tells us is that the, our DNA is transcribed into RNA, and then this RNA makes a protein. And those proteins are the basis of everything that we have in our body, and they are very specialized. Now, I said we have three billion letters of DNA. This is important in what's gonna come later. All, out of all the DNA that we have, we only have around 23,000 protein coding genes. So if I take all the possible genes that we have in our DNA, only 23,000, which makes up roughly around 4% of our DNA, actually produces protein. The rest doesn't do much. And that's, that's quite interesting. We inherited it from our ancestors from since the evolution of time. And it doesn't quite do much, but we're learning a lot more about what, what, what it does. So that will come handy later on um, very quickly. One other important aspect that I want to share with you as well is about mutations. So we all have the same DNA. We share about 99.9% .9 of, our, of our genome. Every once in a while, you have uh, a mutation. And what's a mutation is that, so you're supposed to have a guanine here, but somehow, for some reasons that are not yet well understood, you might have a cytosine, right? So that creates an impact. So most of the, the, the mutations that we have don't do much in your body. In fact, if I were to take your DNA right now, I'll find millions of mutations. The majority don't do anything, but some of them might. So this mutation exactly in particular that you're looking at is what gives us red hair, right? That's exactly, that's why we have people with red hair and it's a beautiful mutation. You could think of it as nature getting creative, right? So that's a good thing. However, some mutations are not so cool, if we were to use that word. Asthma, for example, and diabetes are resulting from genetic mutation. Healthcare has evolved uh, so far so that we can live with those diseases and not die. But some other diseases, not so much. Multiple sclerosis, sickle cell anemia, ALS, which came to prominence through the ice bucket challenge for those who remember, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and the list is long. All our genomic diseases, genetic diseases, sorry, we don't quite understand them fully yet. Cancer. So what's cancer? If I were cancer, are cells that have acquired the, the characteristic of continually dividing in an unrestrained manner. So just, just keep growing and growing and growing. And they ended up invading surrounding tissue. Why do they behave this way? Well, it's because there is a change in their DNA sequence and that gives them this characteristic, aka a mutation. And what you see here is a human melanoma cell undergoing cell division. This is just an example. So bottom line, if we want to understand cancer, we have to look at it from at a genetic level. That kind of explain why two people having the same type of cancer, like you look at it and you see, okay, this is a liver cancer, for example, they take the same um, treatment, doesn't have the same results because at a genetic level, it's very different. So that's why genomic is very important. Now, to summarize, where, where can genomic help? And what is it? Genomic is this field at the intersection between biology, chemistry, computer science, and, um, and some uh, also engineering as well. And it, it's, its aim is to answer several questions about how our body works. So a couple of questions, a couple of use cases that you could do with, with genomics. First one, understanding our genome just so we can know what, what it's about. One, one first use is to understand our genes. I mentioned earlier we have 23,000 protein coding genes, but I put an almost close to it because there's still a field called gene prediction where we're still trying to understand all the genes that we have. So we're not done yet. The second one is identifying mutations, right? 
I spoke about it, and that's going to be a big part of what's coming up in the talk. Another area is if we know all the possible mutations, can we link that to diseases, right? And I want to call out one very important project. And if you can look it up, just go ahead. It's called the Thousand Genome Project. And that's a project that started, if I'm not mistaken, in 2008. And the idea was, let's take 1,000 people, let's have their genome, let's get their mutation, and let's see what patterns they have in common. And it got a lot of results. And as we speak, I think they went beyond the 1,000. I think it's like 3,500 genomes that they have as of today. Another interesting aspect is understanding human evolution. So you remember when I said that there is a piece of our genome that doesn't quite do much? It's a piece of it that, that, that <clears throat> people who work in evolutionary genomics use to understand how we've evolved from other, uh, throughout, the, throughout the years and the millennia. And I would recommend the book, Who We Are and How We Got Here. And if you get to read it, just go ahead and read it. It's very solid research and it's quite an interesting read on that front. Another very popular use of genomics, and I'm sure maybe some of you have, to have tried to do it or are wanting to do it, is called an ancestry test. It's those tests that you get that tell you about your ancestry and your ethnicity. They tell you maybe you're 75% from Great Britain or Iberian or whatever. And that kind of came to prominence. There's a big company called 23andMe, and they make a lot of, uh, a lot of those. So that's also a burgeoning area. But if you ask me, or ask people in the field, what is the holy grail? What is the one thing that we really want to achieve? That one would be called pharmacogenomics. So what does that mean exactly? It means that if I take people who ha happen to have the same condition, like same, same cancer, same phenotype as we want to use it, and we can know what is their DNA profile, we could design a treatment that is specific to them. And we could avoid the treatments that aren't gonna have negative effects on them and the ones for whom they won't have any response. That's the hope. And you might have encountered this with a fancy name called precision medicine. So that's really the hope of the field of the people who work in genomics. So if you're thinking about where you wanna uh, take your career next. Well, here are a couple options here for you. So I really encourage you to follow it. All right. So this kind of concludes our introduction because from now on, we are going to talk about the how. How do we do all of that? And where does the tech come in place? At which point do we do it? So now we're going to like open, open the valve and see what's happening inside. I want to start first by, it all starts by talking about the Human Genome Project. Because at some point, we, we were able to know what our genome looks like. And I want to give you a little path through history, but I'm not going to go through the details. If you find a documentary about it, just go ahead and read it. This is through from 1865 to 1990. And so in, around 1865 is when the first DNA cell has been extracted. So it was extracted biologically, not quite understood, but that was a start. In 1953, a lot of you might be familiar with Watson and Creek, the helix uh, structure. So that's when it was first uh, discovered. The first sequencing method was in the 70s. It's called the Sanger method, still used to today. And then came come 1990, where all the researchers said, OK, all of this is nice. We discovered a lot of things. We also discovered that we as human beings, we all have somehow the same genome. So how about we extract it? How about we get that book? How about we see that blueprint? So this endeavor took 13 years. And if you ask me, it's one of the major uh, achievements of, the, of a human beings. Probably, I would be controversial, but I would say more important than the moon landing, if you think of it. It took a lot of a lot of time, a lot of publication, a lot of work, and it culminated in 2003 where it was announced. For those who remember, maybe you've seen it by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, where they announced that the first human genome has finally been mapped and released. That was a very, very big announcement. Now, let me tell you a couple of things about the human genome. So at, in 2003, this was the first version of it. And we called it HD16 and CVI Build 34. And of course, it had a lot of gaps into it. There was a lot of work that needed to be done for it to be considered fully complete. So from 2003, 4, 6, 9, and 13, there were multiple releases 
the latest release is called GRCH38. You can think of it like an operating system having a lot of updates. So this is the most updated version that we have, a quite, quite well uh, structured. Two things I want to tell you about this human genome project. The first one, there was a decision that was made that the human genome would be patent free, meaning that there wouldn't be any organization that would patent whatever they found. And at that time, it might have seemed like, well, why is this even important? Or maybe the people who discovered might have gotten upset about it. But this, has, but this was very important because it allowed all the research that would happen later, which I will tell you about in a bit, to actually collaborate. So if you make a research, you make a finding, you discover a variant, you can publish it, and a lot of people uh, in, some da in, other, in public libraries, and a lot of people can actually use it, and this can only accelerate research. So that was number one. Number two, it's valid to ask the question of where, where does this genome come from? How was it assembled? Who were the human beings who actually contributed cells to it? So, um, so this was re um, uh, assembled from what you would call Caucasian type humans from, uh, from the north of, uh, of the US. So although, so although if we were to take another person from China or South Africa or something, the genome is not gonna be that different. After all, we're all from the same species. The question was, what if there were some minute differences that were in different regions as well that would be interesting? So keep in mind those two, those two informations because they will come in handy in a second. So some of you might be wondering, well, if there is a build, can I download this genome? Well, the answer is yes. You could actually go online and download your human genome and look at it. And here is the link. In fact, even better, you even have a browser. So uh, from the NCBI, National Center of Biotechnology and Information, you can look at all the different chromosomes. You can, you can download the file here. So you have the reference genome. It has a standard file format called FASTA, and you can also do a lot of browsing, a lot of research. And I'll come back to this website in a second, but that's, that's pretty cool. You could actually um, do that. The other thing that I mentioned is that since this genome has been made by Caucasian, um, from Caucasian, I would say, cells, some countries started to do, you know what, let's build our own reference genome. So because maybe those tiny variations can that uh, that are geographically linked could we could learn something from so some that i can mention and so uh genome england hundred thousand genome project sweden as well they had one and they even had population genomics from the vikings you know which kind of is sounds cool but also makes a lot of sense because the vikings traveled all over the world so it's very interesting to see how that has impacted the rest of the populations uh, the arab genome so from the emirates uh, turkish genome project south africa and even the qatar genome program so there's a lot of countries that now want to assemble their own genome so that they can find um, so that they can understand it better and a little chauvinistic aspect of me kind of wonder, can I add Moroccan genome in here one day? So that would be pretty cool. I don't know. So that's, so that's probably food for thought. Okay. So now we're going to get into the meat of the topic and the tech. So earlier I said the genome project took 13 years, $5 billion. And now we're here looking at countries that want to go like 100,000 genomes and all that. Like, what happened that makes this possible? Uh, so this is where I want to share with you the big improvement that has happened over the year, and which is now the state of the art where we are right now. And it has the fancy name of next generation sequencing. So if you're asking me right now, tomorrow I want to go give a blood sample, take my have my genome, how do I do it? How, what is the process? Well. Here it is. First of all, there is a biological sample that gets take, that is taken and it's being prepared uh, and uh, in general in a wet lab. And we have machines called sequencers. So some of them are as big as, uh, let's just say a bulky printing machine. And some of them are as big as a refrigerator. And then what do we get out of it? We get chunks of DNA. So we don't get the full three billion sentence. Uh, simply because of technological limitations that we didn't overcome yet. And maybe if we have another talk, we could delve into that at some point. We call these reads, DNA reads. Remember that because it's going to come later in the call as well, in the talk as well. 
and the and, and depending on which instrument that you use uh it could be like 100 bases to a couple thousand bases so that's what you would that's what you would get that's how you would you would get your dna now i want to share with you how this next generation sequencing has changed the world which making all those countries jump in and want to have their own uh, their own sequencing pro uh, genome project so first of all the the sample preparation has gotten a lot simpler uh, there these machines are high throughput data so there's a lot of data that is being generated at the same time anybody who's doing big data is familiar with high throughput data analysis so that's big data processing here the read the reads that are being generated are a lot longer. I'll come back to this point in a second. There's a lot more precision and lower cost. So we really expecting that um, by, um, oops, hold on, too fast, <laughs> that we're expecting that by 2025, there will be around 100 million genomes that would be sequenced. I think around, we are the couple millions right now. I don't have the latest number, but that was the projection then. Now, I want to tell you a little bit about this, why this increased read length matter. Remember when I told, told you about the mutations? I only told you about the simple mutations, like C, and then something happens here. This is called a deletion or a change. These are called single nucleotide uh, variations, like just on one base. And they're a lot easier to find when you have small reads. However, a lot of times there are more complex mutations that happen. So sometimes you can have a full section of the DNA that gets deleted. Or sometimes this full section of the DNA actually moves location. Or sometimes it gets duplicated. These are called structural mutations. They're a lot harder to find. And they are linked to a lot of diseases that, oh, sorry, a lot of diseases that we don't yet underst understand are being caused by such mutations. So therefore, if we manage to have sequencers that can give you th multiple thousands of reads, that can have a lot of, a lot of impact. So that's why that is important. Two things, I had to introduce a Moore's law for our computer science friends. So the sequencer's cost have dramatically uh, um, decreased. You could sequence your genome for like $100 right now. And if some of you might have done it, it's about $400, $500. Sometimes you can even have your own, uh, your own uh, file at hand that can be shared with you. So this is what's making this uh, number of genome really, really increase. And we expect that there will be around 700 petabytes of data that is being generated. Now you might, 700 petabyte, that's like a lot of data. That's like 700,000 gigabytes, um, terabytes, actually. That's a lot of data. So, and the reason why is that the size of a genome file can be pretty big. So a question you would ask me, how big is a genome file? So if we're talking about a full genome, some, it can go up to 100 gigabytes for one person because of the different machines that you would, the different sequencers that you would use and the different type of information that I include, it could go up to that point. If we talk about a whole exome and whole exome, we're only talking about those 23 genes that do proteins, that, that's the number you would have. And sometimes oh, and the genotype and the gene panel, that's a lot smaller. This is what you would do if you go to a hospital and you just wanna know if you have uh, like diabetes or, or uh, heaven forbid, maybe a breast cancer or something, that's what you would be doing. That's not a lot. But in what we're talking about, that's how big a, gen what a genome file can be. So if you think that's a lot of data and we have a problem of data analytics and you gotta be well equipped to, to go about it, you're right. So this is where we're reaching our um, section of the talk where we're doing, where we're talking about the actual analysis of those genomes. So now buckle up. It's gonna get a, we're gonna get as technical as, as possible on this one. So here is what you see here. W what we want to do is from a biological sample, the promise is that we would have a treatment. And what I just explained to you is that we have this part called sequencing. We took some a biological sample, we put them in a sequencer and we have sequence of reads. Of course, I'm, I'm very simplifying here a lot of this. So how do we move from this to potentially treating a cancer? 
and how do we understand those 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 data points so these reads by themselves they're not really useful to you there are quite a few steps that i will explain to you that that are necessary and useful for you to be able to do that so first let's talk about a process called secondary analysis so reassembling the genome okay so if tomorrow you were to sequence your genome and you ask them give me the raw data this is what it looks like exactly that and just look here this is this would be like your read your seek your your uh, your sequence of dna like cg at etc etc this is what we call the raw raw sequence this would be like the id of the instrument and you have a long file that has all those all those sections you can't really do much about this one because it's just a bunch of reads because there are two critical informations that you don't have the first one is you don't know which chromosome it's coming from, and you don't know which location in that chromosome it is. So where is this? Where is this in chromosome one, two, three, X, Y, where is it? You don't have that information. Our sequencers don't are not yet able to do that. And I don't know if that will be able anytime soon. So therefore, what you need to do, since we have a reference genome, we need to align those to the reference genome. So we have that those three billion, we need to find where each one of these is in the genome. So this is where um, I have a little exercise for you, specifically the computer science students, the ones who are doing taking algorithms class, I have a little exercise for you, just so you can see what that is like. So let's suppose you have this big file, and I have three points here because we have three billion letters. So this is your whole genome. And you have this, these letters, and it's hidden here, right? That's why I highlight, conveniently highlighted it for you. But you want to find where this string is located in here. How would you do that? And I'm going to give you another information. Sometimes you cannot assume that you will exactly find it as is, because as we explained, there might be mutations. So you might have... Uh, a letter that has changed, you might have a letter that has been removed, and you might have something that's got inserted, okay? So you need to take this string and find it in there. How are you gonna do it? Maybe we can, I can give you like two, three seconds to think about it. So I bet, and the, the first instinctive answer mm -hmm. that you would have would be you know what i'm just gonna take this guy and i'll go to this first location here and i'll see if i can find it and then if not well i'll move to the second location and then if not i'll move to the second location and i would and that's how i can find it well that's that's quite a logical way of doing it we call it the brute force way very simple way to implement it very simple way to explain it unfortunately not efficient because the time that it would require you to do this is just not feasible uh, it might take you hundreds of years if you were to do it on multiple samples so that is not how you would do it Pl uh, so just to make it simple for you and maybe this could you could wreck your brain around it a little bit i'll just give you a little hint uh, and for the computer science of you this uh, this might be something to look after what you would do is that you would you would think just like what we did with the web we have an index of the web that's how we're able to make search so fast so we have an index for the genome as well so it's been put as a genome for fast information retrieval and if you were to find to do the comparison of the strings you're not going to do a copy paste <laughs> or a search you'll do you'll do a family of algorithms you would use that are called approximate string matching problems so if you have your algorithms class when you start just ask your <laughs> just ask about this one just for the sake of time um i'll i'll, I'll just skip the explanation here um and i will just show you what it's going to look like so what are you looking at? It looks very, very uh, like busy and all that, but I'm gonna explain it quickly. All those reads that we had all jumbled are now aligned. What you see here are the little locations in a specific chromosome. So you see they're sequential 78281. So I took all my reads are now well aligned and I know where they are positioned and I know where they are. Right. So that's the first thing that I did. I align. So for every read that I have in my file, 
I know where they are as opposed to the, uh, to the reference genome. But now, I'm not interested in everything. Remember, what I want to do, I want to find the disease. And sometimes I'm only interested in one section of the genome if I know about it. Sometimes I'm only interested in only the mutations. I don't want to see all the rest. So what I want to do after I align, I want to extract the mutation. So basically, I want to compare the reference genome with, the, with what I have, and I see what are the differences, right? So let's, for the sake of argument, and I have another computer science problem, algorithm problem for you. I take this section here, and I try to see for this area here, where you see the letters, I want to try and see, is this a mutation or is it an error? Because maybe when we read those, there is an error. So the reference genome tells me at this specific position, there should be an A. My instrument gave me all those reads. And at this position, I see a T. T, A, 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 and then here is a T, and then A's, and here a T again, etc. So now question, is there a mutation there? Is there a T? Or is it just an error and I should consider the A's? So a naive way would do it would be to say, hey, you know what, let's just take a percentage. If you, I see it more than 50% of the time, then I just call it in one center on one side, which I'm pretty sure some researchers have done at some time, but that didn't yield to results. So that's not how we would do it. We would use some probability, right? So uh, those of you whom I remember a Bayes theorem at some point or have struggled through it and have wondered when on earth are we going to use this Bayes theorem? Well, there you go. I found it for you. Bayes theorem is being used here. And if you remember it, that's, that kind of sounds like it. So based on some prior uh, conditions, what is the probability that something might happen? Something like that. So in this case, we include additional information. We don't just look at what we see here. We also look at some, some of the scores that the instrument has given us, et cetera, et cetera, and at this position and all the reads. And it gives us a, um, a percentage, like what, this is the most likely uh, letter that you would see at this, at this stage with a, the with a score. So I know this is a lot, but just giving you a little bit of uh, content of what's happening and where, where um, this probability is happening. At the end of the day, this is what it would look like. So if tomorrow you did all these steps and we extracted all your mutations, you'd get a file that looks like this. Now, don't, get, don't look at everything. I just want to pay attention to some aspect. This is where your chromosome, this is why, so this is only for the guys here. This is the position. This is what it should be in the reference gen genome. This is what we found in your genome. Right? And this is where it gets interesting. You see this ID here? These IDs tell us, and, and this is coming from some other tools, that this is a mutation that has been studied before by somebody else. It's not the first time that we find it. We actually saw it somewhere else. It has an ID, it's in a database, it's somewhere so you can go look it up. So remember when I said earlier that the fact that nothing was patented um, it gave birth to a lot of databases, a lot of research where a lot of content is being posted. Well, you could see, you could see some of it here. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about this part because it's very, very important. But I want to first summarize what I just told you right now because I probably um, scared some of you with all the algorithmics that happened. So, so far, what have we seen? We've sequenced our DNA, we had all those reads, and we assembled it, we extracted our variants. Now, some of you might be wondering, do I have to code all of this? Do I have to rebuild all of this? Well, the answer is not really. A lot of people have done that before you. So all I described so far is called a variant workflow. So it has already been implemented in a lot of tools. Now, albeit there's a lot of improvement that still needs to be made to them. There's a lot of research that happened in those fields, um, but, but there is a lot of work that was done so that you could fast forward to the, to the, the mutation extraction right away. So I'm just going to share with you some resources for anybody who wants to go there. 
Broad Institute is really the institution from MIT that has contributed a lot of tools that can be used. One of them is called JTK. Uh, there is a workflow um, uh, engine called Cromwell. And that these are, you wouldn't go wrong if you use those, basically. Uh, I, and uh, they even have a GitHub. So you could go right now. And, and use it. Um, Azure as well. Like I work at Microsoft. I'm very familiar with the uh, with the Azure platform. We have an online. We have a, an implementation of Chrome of Cromwell on Azure. And there's also the Hail as well for those who love Python. You could also use all of these. So everything has been implemented. Now, if you're like me and you kind of like you're kind of a SaaS person, so we all, there's also a service that does. Um, the alignment and the, the variant call in right away for you. And for and if you like open source as well, there's another platform called Galaxy where you could do all of those searches. So plenty of option, which kind of tell you like this is the best time to go to genomics because there is so much that has already been done. And that can get you started right away. So we've seen that so that now we've been able to sequence the, get the DNA sample, sequence it, get the reads, assemble it with the reference genome. We extracted the mutation. Now the real work starts. This is where the clinicians, this is where the bioinformaticians, this is where the researchers come into play because now we wanna understand a specific disease. So let me go back to this file that I showed you earlier. This file, again, you wouldn't be able to do much about it with it, you would have to do additional things. You would have to add some additional informations from all those databases that we have. We call it, this process, annotation. So you would add information about this variant. So like, here is its ID. What information do we have about it? You might wanna locate the genes that are corresponding with it. And you would use some other databases to do that. So where would you get this information? And this is where, uh, the, the, the data will start piling up on this file. So let me first tell you about uh, a database that currently exists in about genes, where we have all the information about the current genes. It's called gene ontology. What does a gene ontology do? And by the way, you could go tomorrow and look it up. Uh, it tells you what is the molecular function of those genes, what cellular component it takes part to, and most importantly, what are the biological processes and pathways that it takes part to? Because it would be very simple if every gene was associated with one phenotype, with one process, etc. But that's not the case. In general, a lot of things get jumbled together and we call them pathways. So I encourage you to look it up, even if for curiosity, you can go to gene ontology and look at all the things uh, that, that, that are there, how you can enrich your data and how you can see all those wonderful pathways. So that's one thing that you would do. Now, one of the things that you would do is that you would look at that ID. Remember that uh, that little uh, um, that mutation ID that I showed you here. So we're back now to that tool that I showed you earlier called um, the where you can browse your genome. So in this in this browser, one of the function that you could do you could select a human. You could also look at all the different uh, species that we have and, and that we're related to. And you can say, remember the genome reference, the version, so GRCH38, you could choose 37 or something like that. And I wanna understand more about this mutation. What have other researchers found about it so that I don't reinvent the wheel? So you'll see something like this. Now I'm gonna make it simple for you. It might look like a lot of information, but I'm gonna try to simplify it. You'll get a view like this and it just shows you where does this fall in which chromosome. So we find again our Y chromosome here. And if you click on one aspect, what you will see, that's what I, I zoomed in here, you will see that there is also already a lot of information that other researchers have done about it. Like we know this mutation, we even have a publication on it. So PubMed is one resource that where you have a lot of uh, research paper. And we also have some clinical information about it. So the first thing that I would do is that I would go check it out and I would go read about it. So I will show you right now in what follows screenshots from all of these tools, but this is really just for the sake of argument to show you everything that is possible now 
now and the resources that are there. So the first one, I can have some information on my single nucleotide polymorphism that we call it. It's like the single mutation. So it's a short variation. So I have some information about it. Here is the ID, right? I can also know about the genome variation, how it relates to human health. So this is another view where I can know about the condition in particular, what sort of genes does it, does it impact, etc. And last but not least, there it happens that it so happens that there is a medical paper. And I don't know much about this paper, but just put it out of uh, for for the sake of example. You can also read about what other people have done. Now, this concludes. A little bit more. This was not concludes it, but this was what so far what what we have seen is a glimpse, a tip of the iceberg of what a bioinformatician would be doing when it comes to, to, to tertiary analysis. There's a lot more. If we had more time, I would tell you a lot more about it because as you can see, I love these things. <laughs> so what have we done so far? We, we've taken a biological sample, we've broken it down, we extracted the reads, we aligned it to the reference genome, we extracted to the mutation, and then we started the work. We started to do the research and all of that. And hopefully, hopefully, all of this research would lead to a treatment. Now, what kind of treatment are we, are we looking at? Remember earlier I talked about precision medicine. So a couple scenarios that we're really hoping for. One of them is obviously tailored drugs to patients for more efficient treatment, right? No one size fits all address the influence of microorganism on health by sequencing the microbiome. And that, I'll tell you a little bit more about the case of not a microbe, but a virus COVID in a second. Um, design personalized cancer, uh, cancer treatment based on analysis of tissue of a tumor, basically what we apply in the process we've had, eventually determine the causes uh, of new uh, issues uh, with newborn sooners and uh, gene therapy to prevent diseases and eventually prevent, predict inherited diseases. These are the kind of things. And hopefully through the talk that you have just listened to, you might have start having intuition about how all of the things can help us realistically achieve that. Now, I'm reaching the last part of the talk and I promised you that I would talk to you about COVID, right? How does this fit with COVID in particular? So what is COVID? COVID is a virus, and virus have been around for billions of years, uh, eventually, probably even have evolved a lot uh, faster than we did. What you're looking at here is, is the COVID gene, is the genome of COVID, by the way. I'll let you admire it. <laughs> so COVID has been around for a while. It's a virus, uh, well-documented. It's been attacking animals. And so far, someday around October, November uh, 2019, all of a sudden people started catching COVID. So what happened? Well, if you've been listening, um, mutation, that should be the first word that would come to your mind. And indeed, there's a mutation that happened at the level of the COVID genome somewhere, somehow, we didn't know it then, that made it now capable of choosing humans as a host. and proliferating and eventually causing uh, infections. So the first thing that a bioinformatician would do would be like, show me the genome. I need to see what is that change that happened. And indeed, this is what people did. This is January 2020. So what you're looking at is the number of, uh, sequence, of sequencing that happened on the COVID genome. Here are the different countries that you see here. So these are, so in, and at the bottom you see, uh, sorry, my, this is a bit slow. Uh, from January to April, these are the number of COVID genomes that have been sequenced. So COVID is a virus. Its genome is a lot simpler than ours. It doesn't have 3 billion bases, but just a mere thousands. But that can give you an idea. Idea. So it started with China, they published the genome, and, and then we have found one in Nigeria, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. And now as we speak, there's about 1 million coronavirus sequences um, that have been, that we have access to that we can understand so that we could study that genome and understand how it evolves and moves on. Why is this important? Number one, vaccine. So if you all know a little bit, what's a vaccine? A vaccine is basically uh, a, a, a less virulent, a lot less virulent version of a specific virus that you put in your body in order to trigger your immune system so that so you, uh, so you, you can withstand that virus. 
very simplified uh, explanation, of course, but that's kind of the principle. So if we want to have a COVID uh, vaccine, we need to understand the COVID genome. So that's where this was absolutely instrumental. The other use of what you're seeing is on the question that you might be asking yourself since you started hearing about the Indian variant, the UK variant, the South African variant. This is a virus that mutates. What is the guarantee that we have that it's not going to change or and then we have another version of it? Well, the answer is not really. We don't have a guarantee, but what we can do is that we can keep monitoring it. And in fact, this is what's happening at this moment. So let me share with you uh, one site called nextstrain.org. And if you have your browser, I encourage you to, uh, uh, to to go and check it out. So I discovered Next Train a little while ago, uh, recommended by well-known well Bill Gates. If it's good for him, it's good for me. So, uh, and it was during the time of the Zika virus. So what this research group here, it's actually uh, an organization, is that they take the genome of a lot of viruses and they monitor them over time so they can see how they evolve. So what about... COVID. Well, at the time when I took this, um, this screenshot, it was last August. So it was 19A, etc. So when you, when you hear the term strain, this is what we're looking at. This is time. So at first it was 19A, like the blue strain, if you want to call it. But then as time went by, it evolved and we saw another strain. And then it evolved again and we saw another and then another and then another. That's what viruses do. Now, it doesn't mean it's another uh, race, <laughs> it's another different virus, but a strain means that it has changed enough so that it has acquired new behavior. And just to finish, I have a little video for you here. Um, I hope it can play that that shows you a little bit of a time lapse um, of how uh, how um, COVID has evolved from uh, it, that was in August. Uh, no, December till August 2020 last year. So you could see how how those different variants are appearing and changing, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Now, this is not to spook anybody, <laughs> obviously, but this is uh, the bottom line of this is that this uh, is that moving forward, uh, we cannot stop viruses, at least not that I know of. But what we can do from a national health poli policy is to have genomics as a, as a capability in the sense that you do monitor around and you see how the th how uh, the viruses that are known evolve and you can have the capability of prevention. So that's it for me. Um, I, we, we really we come into the end of the talk. I want to leave you because I know there are some students and probably some professionals as well who are interested about the topic with a couple of resources. Rosalind, it's it's literally a, a bioinformatic programming platform where you get to get to have some exercises like the ones that I showed you earlier and wreck your brain around it. So that's a really good practice. And for anybody, EDX and Coursera, they have a lot of bioinformatic courses. Um, just, just go past certification and they have variety of, of degrees of difficulty. And that's it. You have reached the end of this talk and hopefully you stayed with me till the end. So with that, I give it to, uh, to Safa. And I don't know if we have questions, but I think I'm on time, right? Yeah. Thank you so much for this talk. It was perfect, like very concise, straight to the point, and at the same time, very rich. So it was really interesting. So me as a computer scientist, I was able to follow from start to finish. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, I don't know if we have questions from the audience, but if we don't, I actually have a question. Um, yeah. I think there is a comment. Um, oh, yeah. Dr. Abdash. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's saying congrats from a former professor on an outstanding intro to genomics primer. This would hopefully motivate AUIers to pursue studies in this fascinating area. Dr. And I remember I took advanced quantitative methods for Dr. Okay. Not the easy class, but very fascinating. And then I found mm -hmm. those principles in there. So take the class. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you have any other questions. So I really invite our um, our audience to ask questions. So Tilila is here to answer your questions and to make 
things clear. Um, okay, so uh, I have a question. So let's just wait for the others to have their questions. So, yeah. Um, so I'm actually, um, I did my master's in software engineering and then I started my PhD and I'm working on um, data analysis and data acquisition, basically, in, but in a totally different area in smart grids. So it's more related to energy and uh, yeah, electricity and stuff. But I'm really interested about, I'm really interested by the, both the storage and the processing of the data. Right. And I think that whenever you have big data, the first thing that you think about is how you would store it. So the storage needs to be very efficient, needs to be very appropriate so that when you want to um, to like analyze the data, to process the data, it's kind of easier. Um, yeah. And also for the processing, I mean, the processing is the key. So you have to process the data that you acquired um, using multiple, I don't know, like multiple um, programs or multiple yeah tools or let's say algorithms and so on so that you can have the knowledge that you need um i was wondering like how do you actually store the genome files is it in a just in a simple file or in a specific database no sql database or sql database and also for the processing how do you like uh decide on what like tool to use did you try different uses or in general do they try different use different like tools and so on and then decide on the on the most accurate one so i i had a file no that's actually a very uh, very good question i had a slide but i put it in the let me see if i can find it for you <laughs> um because it, it's quite relevant mm -hmm. so i got it here it is i'll unhide it and uh, and I'll uh, and I'll tell and, and I'll go back to the other one about the tool. So maybe okay. probably we can see it here after this. Thank you. Do we, uh, there you go. Do you see this one? Okay. So so yeah. that's a very relevant question that you just asked. Um, uh, the genomics field has a specific standard of file type that is being used. So and and this is before bef before we actually get the variants, right? So the, uh, the 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 raw data that reads there is a format called FASTQ, and then as we go uh, and and we do uh, the alignment, there is a fa called BAM. So this uh, this is our standard file. Like there is a whole paper and format to it, etc. And then when you have your variants, you see that screenshot that I showed. That's called a VCF, a variant yeah. calling file so mm -hmm. the field has developed its own standard file mm -hmm. now past that point you know you remember when i talked mm -hmm. about annotation mm -hmm. when when you have your vcf file you only have the like oh, how it should be in the reference how you have it blah blah, blah. um mm -hmm. that's where that data you could store it uh in uh, you have a lot more options where you that you can you know, put it in so that you can accommodate all the additional data that you can put in it so no sequel could be one one of it but there are some other file uh, some other file formats that you could use uh you could use data lakes as well but that's where you need to have um you have a lot of options honestly where you could where you could put your 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 data in that in that front uh even uh, like a sequel could could do it like at least well uh, uh, kind of a SQL that would be on cloud or something like that. So past the point of the VCF, you do have a lot of options. Before that, not so much. So these here, what you see here, I would put them in a data lake. In general, people would put them in that in a in a biobank, you would have them in a big data lake uh, and you would need a big data engine to, pers to process them. That's why uh, we see a lot more of kind of SaaS offering, like the Azure Genome, for example, genomics mm -hmm. service that would automate all of that for you, so you don't have to. Yeah, I was going to ask about Azure actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so that's it's kind of like doing all of this mm -hmm. uh, in in one service. But of mm -hmm. course, some people are like, no, I want to have more control. I want to be able to use this tool and this tool and this tool. So these are the yeah. tools that you have. I want to be able to. Oh, so, sorry. These are the tools at the bottom. Uh, I want to be able to use them. So um, that's that. Ooh, am I? Sorry, I was. I was yeah. <laughs> okay. The tools are at the bottom. Uh, the file type are, are, are at the top because I'm. I have got multiple screens. Yeah. It's just, so yeah. these these are the tools. So so if you if you talk about uh, Azure Genomics, it implements all of this for you. You don't have a lot of control. 
Uh, mm -hmm. You don't have to know how your data is going to be stored best that for you. Less control, though, but fast and uh, at access. Simpler. You want more control? You can do it. I, I saw there was a slide. Let me let me find it for you where you have other other uh, framework that you could use that that give you a lot more flexibility. But you got to be you, you got to know what you're mm -hmm. you got to be familiar with. them. There you go. This one here. Okay. So all of these. I, and I encourage you to uh, to use them. If you're a Python mm -hmm. lover, Hale is a good one as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know if you have questions. Are there questions? So for our audience, uh, I don't know if you have any questions to. No, if no questions, the audience can start the weekend early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that too is okay. Yeah, so we have a comment here from Mary. Really interesting topic, and, and thanks for the biology refresher, Tilila. I also love the Game of Thrones analogy and the references that empower us to improve on research and discover treatments. So a Game of Thrones fan here. <laughs> Guilty as charged. <laughs> okay, I don't know if we can have other questions, but anyways, the talk will be uploaded on YouTube and um, everyone can check it again. Yeah, so Rita, she's asking, do you have any idea about the genomic, the genomics field in Morocco? Um. I know that there are some clinical use cases. I've been in touch with some of the vendors of sequencers. Remember the sequencers? There are some of them mm -hmm. that are doing, uh, that are have working with some in some clinical cases. What do I mean by that? Like with hospitals uh, and some uh, advanced clinics. Um, very specific cases, like they not on the whole genome sequences part in the research part, but but I know that there is that. I know there is institute on research of for cancer, so that also uses that part. I'm not aware that there, that there is like a genomic program or genomic uh, Morocco genome project per se. Um, I know there are some biotechnology uh, uh, programs in different universities. Uh, I, I know you, you are used to have one. I hope it's still there. Um, but that would be the extent of my knowledge. And I, uh, I hope that uh, the next time you ask me a year from an hour or two, I would have a lot more to tell you because that's <laughs> definitely... Or uh, you, I could be a pioneer in that. Yeah, there you go. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Silila. I don't know if we have other questions from the audience. But anyways, as I was saying, so the talk will be... Uh, uploaded on YouTube and they can check it again. They can watch it as many times as they want. And so we have a question here. Uh, Mary, would genomics explain how some countries like India is being affected so much and Nigeria isn't? Oh, fact question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so first of all, um, there is, um, we need to remove, include in this uh, in this answer also the capacity for testing so i know that there are a lot of countries specifically mm -hmm. at the beginning where there was almost okay there's no covid but is it because there is nothing or because we're not testing yeah. and we're not getting all the data so so that's that's already something that i have that i don't know if we have enough enough uh, a, a testing capability amongst the countries to be able to judge but assuming we take two countries that that have the same testing capability and one of them has uh is having more than the other uh so there are also other aspects that come that come uh, into the picture so there's testing capability and then there is also the what you would call like um the uh, the policy that have been made like social distancing and uh, are people, um, ha have people been lo in lockdown or no? Are people meeting each other or no, et cetera? Um, the, the bed capacity of the different hospitals. So how, has, how was the, the policy to contain uh, the, uh, the, um, the, the outbreak handled? Are, are they at the same level? So you would, you would measure that as well. Um, and then if all is the same, 
um, then then you would go uh, from a uh, from a genomics perspective. You would look at at the virus, how it is, and how how uh, fast does it uh, does it uh, mutate. And what I mean by that, what type of mutation did it have? Did the did what type of variant? What type of variant has has been uh, has uh, has generated from that mutation? Is it a variant that? Uh, that kind of clings to the body a lot faster than another one. That could be a possibility. Uh, one of the first things that we found when the COVID genome has been uh, has been sequenced is that the mutation happened at the level of a connector. So a connector that the virus has. So now that the mutation has happened, it was able to connect to the lungs. That's how it could have connected to the liver or the heart or mm -hmm. what it was happening in the lungs, right? So from that, if I, if I keep on monitoring uh, the genomes of the different variants that I find, and I keep looking at that specific sequence and see how, how it evolves, I could possibly understand um, why, um, why a, a virus, why a strain could be more virulent than another. So on, on, a, case by, on a case by case. So that, that would be the extent of the explanation that you would have. Providing that you also rule out all the other all the other aspects that that cause an outbreak. Yeah, exactly. Thank you very much, Tilila. Thank you so much for this talk. It was really interesting. Um, Rita has another question. What job profiles do you think are the most needed in genomics and bioinformatics in general? Uh, uh, okay, so let's look at them here in the file, <laughs> or if we look at the, uh, the okay, or, or maybe another slide would be better for it, so I can, uh, one second. Okay, so at this level, uh, this is wet labs, so these are really uh, chemists, basically biologists, who can take a, 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 a sample and extract it. So that would be a type of, of, of uh, function here. The sequencers, that's a very big field. And you, you find them in very in specific co companies that make sequencers like Illumina, PacBio. Uh, these are just the first two that came to my mind. This is a very specific skill. It's like hardware engineering, but also chemistry and biochemistry as well. So so you have this, this, this is a feel, a possibility that, uh, that's there. And, and like I said, we're not yet able to have very, very long sequences of mm -hmm. genomes. So there's a lot of work that's happening done. And this would be like big companies that design those sequencers. Now, from a bioinformatic perspective, as soon as you reach here, uh, as a bioinformatician, so this is a field of computer science, by the way, like I had my master's in that, but that was in the department of computer science. So, um, so here, machine learning, data science, um, and, and also data engineer. I, I, Wasafa, I think you, you asked about all the data in the pipelines and where is this stored. So data in, being a data engineer, big data engineer is very important here. So, so that's, that would be the type of profiles here. Here is, is really, uh, that's where it reaches the clinician phase. You really, because at, at this point, you are researching a disease or, um, and, and, and this is like a physician, I would say, but you would be a bioinformatician working with a physician or working with a research lab. So, so bioinformatician uh, functions would be, would be the ones. That's a long list of jobs, but. but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hope that answers Rita's question. Um, yes, I think we'll stop here. Uh, we had a good amount of questions. Thank you so much for taking the time to answer those. Uh, thank you so much, really appreciate you being here. It was really interesting and I'm pretty sure, um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people got to benefit a lot from this talk. Thank you so much, Tilila. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, Dr. Huda is saying thank you, Tilila. That was an excellent talk. Thank you and thanks for inviting me and uh... And that's a really great uh, opportunity, kind of coming back and giving a talk to the university. It always feels a uh, <laughs> circle. Uh, but keep yeah. it up, and I, 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 for one, enjoy listening to uh, familiar faces that I see coming back to this tech talk. So I hope mm -hmm. this is going to be, uh, uh, this has been uh, beneficial to all of you. And feel free to reach out at any moment.
No yeah, of course it was very, it was very, it was very beneficial. Uh, thank you so much for the audience. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, uh, make sure you follow us on Instagram at AUI Alumni Tech Talks and like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel and wait for the upcoming talks. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye.